good Sunday morning to you, even though it's on Wednesday when we're making this uh, little program to show to you. Great verses this morning. A great story about uh, who is our hope and what is that hope. And uh, as usual, they've done something in the quarterly that I don't agree with. They left out three verses, but we're gonna we finished up on verse nine in First Peter, and we're gonna I'm gonna read that verse again, but we're gonna start in verse ten. So we're gonna be in First Peter, first chapter, tenth verse. I'm also going to do something else today that I've never done before, but I've read this in the King James, the New King James, the NIV, the Amplified Bible, and I've come to the conclusion for my understanding, and I hope for your understanding, that the New Living is very correct in this and is much easier to understand than the other versions are. So I'm going to read to you, which I've never done, out of the New Living. And we're going to stop and read some other verses that it's going to refer us to. So let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get started with the Sunday School lesson. Father, it's so good to be able to sit down with Trina and Erlene, look at your word, be thrilled by what it says, and hopefully that all of us will learn something today that we might not have known before. But Father, most of all, the very most of all, I pray that as I teach this lesson, it'll bring honor and glory to the name of Jesus Christ. And in that precious name I pray, amen. First Peter, first chapter, ninth verse says, The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your soul. So now this is about the salvation of your souls, what follows. Verse 10, this salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about. Now, isn't that unusual? These are the guys that are writing the Old Testament, and yet it says that they wanted to know more about this story of salvation and more about Jesus Christ because the Old Testament writers were not shown the church age. And so they had in their mind that when the Messiah come, that was going to be the end of time and that, that's how it was going to work. And God did not show them the church time. And so they had questions as, as they uh, wrote about Jesus, and it tells us in a little, little bit in here that Jesus is the one that's instructing them on what to write in the old, on the Old Testament, and they didn't understand how part of it could say that Jesus is going to come in great glory and honor and all of these things, and yet the same writers were told to write that he was going to suffer and die. And they had a problem trying to understand how those both could be true. But they are absolutely true when you look at it from our side of the cross. I want to read to you out of Psalms 22. Excuse me, I didn't get it all the way over. Psalms 22. And we're going to read a little bit about some of the things that they wrote in the Psalms and in Isaiah. So in, verse, in uh, chapter 22, we're going to read the first five verses out of Psalms. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? 
why are you so far away when I groan for help? Every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night you hear my voice, but I find no relief. Yet you are wholly enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors trusted in you, and you rescued them. They cried out to you and were saved. They trusted in you and were never disgraced. Now we're going to look at a couple of different passages in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53. We're going to read uh, 3 through 6. It says, He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried, it was our sorrows that weighted him down. And we thought his troubles were punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion and crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole, he was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We've left God's paths to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Isn't that a perfect way of talking about what Jesus is and what he's done? Now we're going to go back and see a different picture of Jesus in the Old Testament in Isaiah, the 11th chapter. And we're going to read 12 verses, the first 12 verses of Isaiah 11. Out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot, yes, a new branch, bearing fruit from the old root, and the Spirit of God will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of God, he will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge. Listen to this. He will not judge by appearance or make a decision based on hearsay. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. The earth will shake at the force of his word, and one breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked. He will wear righteousness like a belt and truth like an undergarment. In that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion. And a little child will lead them all. The cow will graze near the bear. The cub and the calf will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. The baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put its hand in a nest of deadly snakes without harm. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all of my holy mountain as far as the waters fill the sea. So the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. In that day, the heir to David's throne will be a banner of salvation to the whole world. A banner of salvation to the whole world. The nations will rally to him, and the lands where he lives will be a glorious place. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to bring back the remnant of his people, those who remain in Assyria and northern Egypt and southern Egypt, Ethiopia and Elam, in Babylonia, Hamath, all the distant coastlands, he will raise a flag among the nations and assemble the exiles of Israel. He will gather, gather the scattered people of Judah from the ends of the earth. As we can tell, some of these prophecies have ha happened about his sorrows and about his death. But a lot of the, the things that are prophesied that will happen are yet to happen. So here we are, we're talking with this, these about these guys that wrote these books 
Psalms and Isaiah and many other places in the Old Testament where Jesus is talked about. And it says again, this salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them, now that tells you who is telling these people what to put out, was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. And you can understand that without the knowledge of the church age, the time in between Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and the coming of Jesus a second time, that they weren't uh, given that knowledge. And they saw him as just one time, and they had a hard time trying to understand how they could write about the same person and in one passage, talk about his glorious return, all glory and power, and he could speak out of his mouth and destroy people, and then put that side to side, but of being a man of sorrows, and talks about the crucifixion, and as Jesus calls, uh, calls out to God. Okay, verse 12. Now listen to what God told these people. They were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for us. In other words, that Old Testament prophecy, for it to all come true, is for you and I as we're seeing back at the cross, not looking towards the cross. And now this good news has been announced to those who preach in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is so absolutely necessary that the whole word of God be preached in our churches today. Some churches, I'm told, some songbooks even, have taken the blood out of the songs and out of the sermons, but it tells us in a little while, without Jesus' blood, we're all lost. It is absolutely necessary that we hear the complete word of God in our New Testament churches today, just as God gave it. It is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. Isn't that amazing? The angels don't understand all of this. But they're looking, trying to understand all of what God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are doing. Verse 13. Now because these things have happened, are going to happen, he tells us some things that you and I need to do. That's the reason I thought we needed to hear those verses in their context because now comes a part that reflects on you and I. Verse 13 says, So think clearly. Use the mind that God gave you. But now be careful. Your mind needs to be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. And if you don't have Christ living in your life, you will not understand these things or care about. But if you are a true believer in Jesus Christ, one of the great promises of all scripture is that God gives the Holy Spirit immediately to those that accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. So our mind, our thinking ability, needs to be tempered with the Holy Spirit of God. So think clearly. Exercise self-control. That's kind of hard for me. I don't always exhibit holding self-control as number one in my life. Look forward to the gracious salvation 
that will come to you when Christ is revealed to the world. And you say, well, we're already saved. No, your salvation is past when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Salvation is today as you grow, as you become, become more like Jesus. But our true salvation will not be complete until we see our Savior face to face on that very special day when he comes back for his church. So you must live as God's obedient children. Self-explanatory. Do not slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. Don't expect a lost person without the gift of the Holy Spirit who's not been through new birth to understand the things that a Christian thinks and believes. It just doesn't work that way. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I'm holy. Well, now what does being holy mean? We put on a little hat that says holy across it, or do we sit with our legs crossed and our arms crossed and look at a look past and try to look intelligent? <laughs> That's difficult for some of us too. <laughs> holy means set apart, means like God. And you're going to find out before we get through here that part of our being holy is how we deal with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Then go back to the old way. Satan will try every way in the world to get you to be the same person after you've accepted Christ as you were before, but that doesn't work. You're a new person. A new creation. Verse 17. And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. Uh-oh. That means no color. No education. Doesn't mean whether you're rich or poor. Educated or uneducated? God has no favorites. He will judge. And in the King James it says we'll suffer loss. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. You must live in reverent fear of him during your time as foreigners in the land. Foreigners in the land. One of the things that Jerry struggles with is I love the United States. I love Texas. I love Yoakum, Texas. I love Rice Road. But Jerry, you're only passing through this place. This is not your home. You cannot make your life depending on the United States, the state of Texas, the city of Yoakum, or Rice Road. We're only here for a little while. Verse 18, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. He didn't pay a little. He didn't even pay a lot. He paid a king's ransom, and he is the king. He paid what nobody else in this universe could pay, 
He paid for yours and my salvation. You hear me? And the ransom he, he paid was not mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Christ. Without the shedding of blood, Scripture says, there is no remission of sins. Without that precious blood that Jesus spilt on Calvary, you and I are just as lost as lost can be. And if he had not fulfilled all of what it was called for, we would have never had a chance. No money can buy it. No work can earn it. No intelligence can thank it. We're dependent on the spilled blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. A reflection of the Old Testament times when the Lamb was slain and the blood was put on the mercy seat and God overlooked the sins of the people for another year. The difference is when Jesus' blood was spilled and we accepted that, our sins are taken care of for all eternity. God chose him as a ransom. Now listen very carefully. God chose him as a ransom long before the world began. That is amazing. Before anything was ever created, when the only thing that existed was God the Father, God the Son, and, and the Holy Spirit, the only three things in all of the world, as we know the world, everything, it was decided that Jesus would pay the terrible price for mine and your salvation because God knew when he created man with a free choice that we would choose the wrong thing and we would fall. And the decision was made then, whenever then is, that Jesus would pay the price and God was willing to allow him to do it. And to the point that, well, Jesus hung on the cross. When all the sins of the world were laid on Jesus, he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And God had turned his back on Jesus because he could not look at our terrible sin and all that it was. Paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom was paid not by, pure, by mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began, but he has now revealed him to you in these last days. We entered the last days when Jesus went back to heaven. Don't ever let anybody tell you that they know when he's coming back because Jesus said nobody but the Father knows. But if you look at the prophecy, you can't help but wonder as you look at our country and the other countries around and all these things, how long God will let it go. But he let it go through some very terrible times before. So all I know is we're in the last days. And I'll tell you something that's closer than that. Jerry's in his last days. 
you know, when I look in the obituaries and, and 80% of the people in the obituaries are younger than I am, it doesn't take Einstein to figure out that my days are numbered. And so are most of yours. Verse 21. Through Christ you have come to trust in God. And you have placed your faith and hope. Did you hear that word? Your faith opens up the door of hope. In God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. And it tells us that Jesus has a name written on his side that nobody knows. That he is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And he's going to come back one of these days and he's going to take the church away. And then in seven years, after a terrible, terrible tribulation, Jesus is going to come back. And when he comes back, He's coming back in judgment. He's not going to be the suffering servant. He's going to put an end to this mess. And that's when it says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Verse 22. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. Now, what is the truth? Jesus is the truth. There is no truth outside of Jesus Christ. So when you believed in the truth, your sins were taken care of. So now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Have you noticed a trend? As I have done these Sunday school lessons, time and time again, God tells us how very important it is for us to love our brothers and sisters in Christ and to also lo love a lost and dying world. There's something special, or should be something special, about the relationship between brothers and sisters in Christ. Love each other deeply with all your heart. Now listen to me. If you got a click, that doesn't mean the people in the click. If you got an age group, it's not just an age group. It's not just uh, Austin Street Baptist Church. It's your brothers and sisters scattered around the world. Some are white, some are black, some are brown, some are Asian, some are Chinese, some are Japanese, some are Russian. Oh, if this world needs anything right now, it's God's kind of love. And that's what you and I are called out to do because we have the, this hope of Jesus Christ in us. As the Holy Spirit leads, he will lead us to love our brothers and sisters in Christ more and more. Verse 23. For you have been born again but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever. Eternal life doesn't start when you die. Eternal life started the minute you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Right then, you were going to live in, through all eternity, whatever that means, with our Savior. Mm -hmm. 
your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. You know how important the book is? Yeah, it's just a book. But the pages are full of the truth of God, of Jesus, of the Holy Spirit, and all that entails. And I'm telling you, if you want to get closer to God, if you want to grow, if you want to be that loving person to your brothers and sisters in Christ, read the book. It's called an instruction manual. Now, sometimes Jerry's kind of bad about getting something new and decide he'll put it together without the instruction manual. But the majority of the time, I have to back up and go get the instruction manual and take off what I've put together and start over again. We've got the book, Old Testament, about the coming of Jesus, about the fall of man, about the coming Messiah. We've got the New Testament. We've got the truth of God. The absolute truth of God. It is the only absolute in the world. This world is trying its best to tell you <clears throat> that you've got to change with the world. But this truth tells me that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he said it was wrong in the Old Testament, it's wrong in the New Testament, and it's wrong now. And if he says it's right in the Old Testament and right in the New Testament, it's right now. As the scriptures say, people are like grass, their beauty is like a flower in the field. You know, that's big time down here. Blue bonnets and all the other things that go with them. People look so forward to looking out and see the flowers out there. But guess what happens? Before very long, they're all gone. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word was preached to you if whoever was doing the preaching was using this book and using all of it. So what am I to say? I put down the title of today's lesson, Who is Our Hope? Who is our hope? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. So good to see some of you back at church. It'll be even better when all of our people can come back. And you do whatever you think is right for you and your health and the health of your family. Our world needs a word from God. And the funny thing is, God chose you and I to be the ones to share that word. And before we can share it with our mouth and make a difference in somebody's life, we need to share it with our life. And show people that there really is a difference when you believe in Jesus Christ. Be holy because God's holy. Be loving because God is loving. Be forgiving because God forgave all of us that accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. I love you. Take care of yourself. See you next time.